Hey everybody, welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. Today, I am thrilled today. We have Eileen Ward as my special guest today. And Eileen Ward is a trusted advisor to her clients, typically individuals and families in business communities who are creating multi-generational wealth for the first time through the scale or sale of their businesses. A.B. Bernstein is a global boutique dually headquartered in New York and Nashville with offices in 51 cities around the world. Eileen's focus is to intimately understanding clients' unique personal values, preconceptions, and goals to help them plan and invest accordingly to. So welcome, Eileen, to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real honor to join you. And I'm very excited to be talking about our topic today because as I briefly mentioned (laughs) before we started recording, this is a perfect opportunity um, and an educational moment, not just for my listeners, but for me, because even though I know about money and I know, you know, save and you should put money in certain places and spend wisely and all that, um, this is definitely going to be an education for me as well. So today's topic, we're going to be talking about women and wealth, a wellness check in. So before we dive into the topic today, can you tell us a little bit about your planning services, Eileen? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So my objective is to be my client's first choice when it comes to who they trust to steward their wealth. And I would emphasize that that's a really important relationship because I'm a fiduciary. Nothing about what I do is transactional. This is truly intended for folks who I hope will be with me and that their children will be clients of mine for the duration of their lifetime because we're doing such a good job and getting them to the outcomes that they desire. So um, it takes a while to build that level of trust in a relationship. So everything I do is really to get to know the other person and what's important to them. All the planning and services that I offer are complimentary. I don't ultimately, you know, make any money unless my clients decide to hire me. So, you know, everything just starts out as a conversation. I really enjoy working with like-minded, hardworking individuals. That's a lot of where my own um, history with thinking about money came from is the importance of hard work Mm -hmm. and also the importance of discipline and prudence. And I really love clients who are actively engaged. I, I think You know, money is a topic that is often faux pas in society, but it's a tool that enables so much for an individual and their family. And so it's a topic that I really enjoy discussing and getting into the weeds and trying to optimize on behalf of my clients. So everything just starts with a simple conversation and um, we go from there and we figure out if it's a good fit and if it makes sense for the long run. Yeah, I think you are point on as far as like, nobody wants to talk about money. Like they do, but they don't like, it's usually, oh, that dress looks fabulous. Oh yeah, I got it on sale, you know, (laughs) stuff like that rather than like, well, what exactly are you making and how are you, you know, using that money for good? Um, And what are you doing with those funds? So yeah. And it shouldn't be a source of shame. I think that is a huge, huge because it's quantifiable, right? It is this number. And because it's a quantifiable thing, it doesn't necessarily make you a good person, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, an enabler. And so I think it's really important to recognize that no matter who you are on this earth, you know, just because you do or do not have a significant amount of wealth, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're treating your neighbor kindly. Right. So I I really value working with, again, people who have really strong core values and want to match the way they think about investing with those values. Yeah, I agree. Because I think, you know, I think people have a stereotype about how rich people are and they have a stereotype how poor people are. And there's both sides of the coin. There are not so nice rich people and then there's fantastic rich people. Same thing. There's not so nice poor people and there's fantastic poor people. And I, I agree, tying yourself, um, your self-worth and your value into how much money you have or don't have is irrelevant because I said this on the last podcast is when you were born into this world, you were born worthy, whether whatever happens to you in life, you know, you are deserving of love and everything. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So would you like to share some background on like where you grew up and how you kind of got into this 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. So I was born in the Bronx, New York, and my parents relocated to northern New Jersey to a little town called Glenrock um, when I was about four years old. And my dad did that. We have very traditional gender roles in my household, but very involved parents. And my dad did that traditional commute into Manhattan to work on Wall Street every single day of his life, the ultimate provider. My mom works in uh, the healthcare field, so really incredibly talented, warm, caring uh person and you know really always brought in, brought up to think about the importance of saving um maybe you're not always talking about investing like when you're little you don't you think about a piggy bank you don't think about the mm. stock market but um i would say that my dad and my uncles um got me you know interested in the stock market at a very very young age and emphasized the importance of having your money work for you mm. while you're asleep Right. Mm -hmm. Because like we all go in, no matter what you do for a living, even if you're a CEO and you're kind of punching the clock. Right. And that's the one lever you have. Right. And the, the benefit of saving and investing is that your money is working for you while you're not on the clock. Right. Um, Rather than like, trading your time for money. Right. Exactly. Um, but it can't work for you unless you figure out how to budget and think about how to start saving and not just saving for a rainy day in a piggy bank. because But one of the biggest and most significant influences, I think, in my life and for my family was that my great aunt, who was Gertrude Ederly, and she was the first woman to swim the English Channel. So that's we, cool. It was <laughs> really cool. You don't even realize like how <laughs> phenomenal it is to have somebody in your family achieve such a astounding athletic feat. My mother's published a book about it, which was, oh, wow. we were all really excited. Um, now what year would that have been? Um, she swam in the Olympics in 1926 in Paris and then swam the channel in 1928. Wow. And, and she was in the Olympics. That's pretty Yeah. Crazy. She was in the Paris Olympics and she took gold and then she also took bronze. Her legs cramped up. Uh -huh. Um, she was seated to take gold, but took bronze in the individual, and she just was such an outstanding example of what can be accomplished, also just from a physical perspective, right? So like everybody in my family is super athletic, we're all really competitive, we cheese and joke around a lot. <laughs> um, but I think between, you know, that work ethic that I saw from both my parents, but also something that you just know is in your genes, mm -hmm. um, you feel like you have to really always do your best, right? That was really a huge emphasis and whatever trade it is you do. Yeah. Um, you just always try your best and not leave anything on the field, like we would say in soccer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I take that and I think about how to apply that to my clients um, and how I'm always trying to do what's best for them and trying to go the extra mile. This business has become very commoditized. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of ways that you can access investments. And I think a reason that clients stay with you and have stayed with me is because of a service level that you provide. And so I really strive to go above and beyond um, and make sure that my clients know that I am maniacal about adding value to not just their portfolio, but also to their lives because their money and their lives are so, so right, tight and twined. Yeah. And, and it also proved going back to Anne Trudy that, you know, women can accomplish anything. And quite frankly, she was the wealthiest person in my family we ever knew. This was your, your grandma. You my grand, my great aunt. Grand, okay. Wow. So, and in 1920, I mean, for a woman to do that. Yeah. She had impressive. a state parade um, in New York city and her name is engraved on the sidewalk near the wall street goal. So we're very proud of her. She lived till 98 years old. Oh, wow. Um, she know. probably swam every day, right? <laughs> so. she, was, she was incredible. Uh, she lasted a really, really long time. Um, That's so my awesome. mother did an amazing job. Um, but you know, so did my uncles, but I think my mom was prim very primarily featured as a caregiver. And when we, we speak about women and wealth, as we proceed through our dialogue, I'm going to emphasize that. And some of the responsibilities that women find themselves having, mm -hmm. right. um, relative to our male counterparts and, and how that plays out financially. So why did you pick A.B. Bernstein? When I think about our brand and our punchline is making money meaningful. We are an unconflicted investment manager with a global presence. So, you know, for anybody who thinks that there is value in stock picking and then there is value in research, you know, having feet on the street in local markets, being able to understand inefficiencies and nuances 
makes us better stock pickers. Mm -hmm. Um, and our research is our approach to security selection, asset allocation, and ultimately planning, which really adds a lot of value to our clients. And I just think the emphasis on independent, unconflicted research with a sole focus on money management, there's only way we can dr drive revenue for our business. We're not a bank. I can't offer somebody mm -hmm. insurance. I can't you know, help them take out a mortgage or provide them a credit card. Um, we really stick to our knitting. Mm -hmm. and. I really like that because I'm being given a job and I can stay focused on that job without any distractions, which allows me to stay focused on my clients, which is what motivates me. Right. So if anybody wanted to find you, how could they find you on the website? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. On I think LinkedIn. that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. It's just Eileen Ward on LinkedIn and I'm very active on Instagram. Um, okay. I think it's a really fun platform. So it's, at Eileen underscore Ward, W-A-R-D. So anybody who did not grab that information, I will have that in the show notes over at shapeitupfitness.com. So you can definitely find all of Eileen's information as well. And you can just click directly there. So let's dive into today's topic, women and wealth and a wellness check-in. So I will let you go from there. I'm just going to sit back and take notes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really passionate about this because, um, you know, in my various levels of experience, I know, and you made a, you know, a great analogy earlier that this is something that you, you're a business owner already. You have all these clients, you have all this talent. And if we're going to use you as an example, certain women just think this stuff is really boring. Like it's like watching paint dry for a lot of people, for a lot of people in general, finding is very boring or it's intimidating right mm. because you have to look at all these charts and maybe if you were never good at math you know this just doesn't feel like it's something <laughs> that comes naturally right, right, and right. totally nothing to be ashamed <laughs> of um i think a lot of I, I was really into behavioral finance um when i attended yeah. university of chicago and got my um you know mba in economics and and finance and a big part of my role as an advisor is helping coach people through hopefully the great times in their life, but also the, the fiscally challenging ones. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's women who statistically find themselves in more challenging circumstances. So I feel very obligated to make sure that any of my female friends uh, feel that they can leverage me as a resource, whether they're a client or not. But really because, as you know, like girl power is taking over and um, women are achieving much, much more in our generation than they have in the past. And my great aunt was somewhat of an anomaly back in the day, right? Yeah, so we've sure. come a long way since then. So um, I just want to share a few statistics to really illuminate that, mm -hmm. that 44% of all households... Um, there is a female primary breadwinner. Very, very different um, necessarily from my upbringing, for example. Right. And that 65% of these women are taking the lead on planning for retirement and for financial planning in general, right? Retirement seems a long, long way off to anybody in even their 20s, 30s, and 40s, right? right. So I think as we influence a tremendous amount of wealth globally, there are 94 trillion in investable assets, but women are only influencing globally 20 trillion of those, which makes me a little anxious. Mm. It makes me want to see my female counterparts step up a little bit, mm. 20 million of 94 million trillion, I mean, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, and domestically, if we're just talking about the US, actually that number improves significantly. It's closer to 50%, over 50%. So if there is, um, 20 trillion of influenceable assets in the US, women are actually influencing 11 trillion. So that's more than 50%. Right. Well, that's what makes the United States a great place to yeah. live. You know, great we have the opportunity. Proud. Yeah, we have the opportunity to do things that, you know, other countries don't allow, which is, I would not be doing what I do if I lived somewhere else, probably. Right. Yeah. It's, it's wild. So, 66% um, of women in the US, um, United Kingdom, India, China, Singapore, Hong Kong identify themselves as the primary decision maker over 
household investable assets. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you might come into those assets, right? So you have to imagine, you know, money does not grow on trees. So 43% uh, of them are the spouse of a wealth creator. So they might not be the person creating the wealth, but they're certainly influencing it. 66% mm -hmm. um, um, when they are the decision makers have inherited a great deal of money. Mm. And, you know, I know in my family's personal circumstance, you know, again, it didn't grow on trees, but every once in a while, life takes its course and, you know, money is inherited or passed down right. through family. So I know, you know, everybody in my family, you know, inherited money when Aunt Trudy passed. Not everybody has the ability to leave money behind, but so 66% right. of women are inheritors, but this is what makes me even more excited. Wealth creators. If you're Ooh. a wealth creator, 75% of women are making the financial decision. So it means, you know, you're, you're controlling your own assets in right. terms of your, your household spending and, and your consumer choices and preferences. You're, you're in control, um, which I've just shared a lot of really big numbers and how powerful women are in terms of our consumption decisions. And again, coming back to how you started with this conversation, you know kind of the typical cliches. You probably are really good at managing your own family's balance sheet. But the difference is that a lot of women don't use professional financial advice, right? So they're flying blind, right? right? It's one thing to make consumption choices, but it's another from an investment perspective. Mm. And we talked about how important it is to have that money working while you're not on the clock. And so, um, of all the women out there, 53% do not have a financial advisor. And of women under 40, 75% do not have a financial advisor. So yeah. I think that's a little troubling because I know plenty of people in their mid to late 20s who are crushing it, mm -hmm. right? And even more so in your 30s when you've matured professionally and you start taking on you know, more responsibility within your role um, at work. And you really have that opportunity. Now, granted, you also may be in your prime spending years if you're raising a family and thinking about that, but that's even more reason to think about the importance of planning because ultimately you, you want what's best for your family and your loved yeah. ones or whatever your value system yeah. dictates. And I think earlier you had said about, um, which I agree with, when you're younger, you don't think about retirement. You don't think about, you know. No way. You're trying you don't to think about life. investing either. Like. <laughs> That's what old people do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think about all those, you know, the people you see on commercials who are kayaking and right. doing time in sunny settings like Florida. Um, you know, it feels so far off. But, you know, one of my messages to anybody who's under 40 is that your clock is ticking, right? Your amount of time for that money to be working compounding mm. is the most mm -hmm. powerful force in the world. So studies have been done that showed that a 22 year old who graduated from college who started investing early and then paused at 35 mm -hmm. and didn't invest for another 10 years. And if the person who didn't start investing at 22 just started at 35, who ultimately ends up with more is the person who started earlier. I too. Huh? That's interesting. So, I mean, that's when you usually yeah. maybe start getting your first paycheck. I mean, God bless you. If you're one of the people who was babysitting or doing something cool in high school that you didn't spend it all on. Right. You know, right. Yeah. College. I was a professional ballet dancer when I was in my twenties. So <laughs> I was scraping pennies and <laughs> doing whatever odd jobs I could to pay the bills <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And a lot of the time, like you said, it's kind of about survival, right? Are mm -hmm. you making enough to feed yourself? And you know, those trade-offs that we make, and it's really challenging again, but you're, you're always living your life according to your values, right? And to what mm -hmm. brings you joy and makes you happy. And all of that is obviously what we should be doing. It's just important to be aware of the fact that there is retirement savings out there yeah. or saving for a rainy day, right? I mean, to mm. the point that, you know, when you're in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, retirement seems so far off, but I think a lot of people have near-term goals for, from a lifestyle perspective or for what type of education they would want for their children or what type of town uh, they can live in or even home improvement, um, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think um, beliefs too kind of come into this a little bit because I know as a ballet dancer, um, I had that starving artist mentality, like that's what was expected. You know, you, you, you didn't make money and 
I wish I had known <laughs> differently then, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that's a really interesting subject you bring up, and we don't stay on it for too long, but um, we are so shaped from just childhood by our parents, our experience, and our parents' right. way of dealing with money. Yes. That it can be self-fulfilling or society's definition of who we are. And you just right. made a really beautiful analogy that articulates that was the profile you felt you needed to embrace. Right. Because yeah, what, there's such a thing as a, baller, a, a, of a wealthy ballerina. Yeah, they're few and far between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, um, I always joked with people, and there is nothing wrong with Goodwill because I love Goodwill, but that's where you shop. Like if you look like you came out of Goodwill and I guess depending on which Goodwill you went to, because there are some really <laughs> nice Goodwills, but like if you had, and this was the eight, you know, eighties, nineties, you know, the, the ripped clothes and the shirt hanging off. And if you look like a ragamuffin, you were a ballet dancer. That was a social <laughs> status. <laughs> I love the profile. I love the profile. <laughs> Well, the, I mean, that even comes back to, so like, what's the problem? Why do so few people, so few women have financial advisors? One of my motivations for getting into the business is I was privileged enough. Um, I graduated into the Great Recession, so it wasn't a really great time to do finance, even though I got to intern at Citigroup and J.P. Morgan and Smith mm -hmm. Barney, all these phenomenal, wonderful outfits on Wall Street. It was a tough time to get into the business, so I was over the moon when I had the opportunity to join Goldman Sachs and in our investment management division. Um, I was there for seven years and learned a ton. Um, definitely makes you really dangerous on the capital markets, on understanding economics, on understanding all of the different relationships between asset classes and securities and how they trade and why markets behave the way they do. Those relationships um, you know, between how, how assets um, behave and perform have served me extremely well in my um, role as an advisor now that I'm at Bernstein. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is most of my clients, when I worked at Goldman Sachs, it's a very financial advising, the community. There's a lot of older men. It's a very male dominated mm -hmm. business. And that's not to say that there's not phenomenal women on Wall Street. Again, if you look, you know, compare Wall Street today to the Wall Street of the 80s, I think there's a right. lot of females at all levels of um, organizations and I'm involved in a ton with phenomenal females in finance. I really do a lot to try to surround myself with my women in investing network and the mm. CFA society and maintain relationships with, you know, other women from university of Chicago, whatever, it, you know, it takes to kind of stay current and um, your skill set. Right. But what's the problem is women often feel that their advisor doesn't understand them or mm. isn't interested in them. And I think a lot of times if, you know, you weren't brought up necessarily with a dad who worked on Wall Street, who ingrained in you the importance of having your money work while you're not working, why would you know about this? There's right. no reason that the average person would would be taught early. Yeah, they don't the teach it in school, so. <laughs> right, no, it's certainly not. I mean, I wish right. they taught more about budgeting in school, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. come on. So yeah. it, it's really interesting, and there's a lot of, uh, gender gap objectives that sometimes maybe go overlooked and that's, you know, financial security and independence. That's something that's important to women mm. often when we, and this is all through some of the research we've done at Bernstein, um, making the investments match the values of the investor. And if our investors are women, you know, a lot of what they say is having financial independence and having security mm -hmm. at all stages of their life. Um, making a positive impact on society, right? Not just owning something because it's going to make them money, but owning mm -hmm. a company that maybe has a more diverse board or has fewer regulatory fines, right? Companies that are well behaved, um, care about environmental causes, things like that. So, you know, making sure that we help our investors meet those objectives is very important. And again, another reason I enjoy what I'm able to offer my clients through Bernstein. So we've always worked at the end of the day, I know I'm talking a lot about women, but at the end of the day, regardless of who my client base is, we approach people as individuals. And I listened to your podcast about the importance of nutrition and, you know, the diversification of what you put in your body and, you know, sugar versus carbs. And, you made a great point when you said everything, you know, you'll plateau if you don't get something that's custom to you. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. I think about investing in the same way. There's a lot of places you can get access to the capital markets these days. The business has evolved. There's FinTech, there's a lot of different ways to access the markets. But if somebody hasn't really gotten to know you and hasn't customized a program for you, I would wager that you're not getting the most out of your investments. And that is, I think, really, truly key to the reason why somebody would work with an advisor versus doing it themselves or trusting right. to a computer. Yeah, I always find that uh, fiscal fitness and real fit, like healthy fitness, they're very parallel in the sense, like there was a couple things that you had said, like um, you had said women don't really feel like they're being relatable to if it's a man who is in charge of their financial advising. And same thing when women come to me, a lot of women look for someone like me because I am a woman over 40 and I'm relatable to like, you're not going to go to a 20 year old who doesn't understand what it is to be 40, yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah, um, there was something else you had said at the end about, um, what did you just say? Um, oh, about being customized. So yeah, same thing. Like I, I think there's so many generic workouts out there. There's so many diets and everything, and you can absolutely go that route. And if it works for you, more power to you. But if it's not working for you or if it's not getting you the result that you want, so like if your money's not working for you while you're sleeping, why would you waste your time on generic information? And yeah. you know, it's it's worth it's worth the investment to get somebody who is experienced and knows what they're talking about and can tailor something for you exactly the way you want it. And I feel like in general, I feel like our society is kind of blurring the lines in the sense of like, I love, I love me some Target. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love Absolutely. Target, but everybody's trying to be these like Walmart and Target where everything is available under one roof. And I feel like we've gotten away from the uniqueness of having little niche markets, you know, and little boutique type things where you go and you specifically go for whatever particular service or product they're offering you. And I think it's kind of muddled everything for us. I mm -hmm. preach sister. I <laughs> love what you just said. Um, I think again, coming back to why I love working at Bernstein is we recognize that there is loyalty out there that, you know, when somebody, you know, moves into uh, a space where I would be an appropriate advisor for them, that they may have worked with somebody historically who they value that relationship. Um, I really like that we're not a greedy firm and that we can work collaboratively. If there is another money manager, we work collaboratively with outside advisors, whether it's their attorney, their accountant, uh, whoever is their trusted professional, we collaborate. Because again, we're not experts in that service. Right. Um, and you made a great point, you know, Target versus the boutique. And what's wrong with both, right? Mm. Like we say that we meet our clients where they need to be met. Mm, and yeah. I think that's what keeps people staying with us is that nobody's trying to jam anything down anybody's throat. It's about what are your unique needs. And, you know, in the Target first boutique example, <laughs> we could probably create some type of event that some woman was going to and why they went to shop at both places. Right. Um, but I think, you know, that is the beauty of working with an outfit. Um, like ours. So I totally agree. It's all about being able to deliver something that's bespoke. Mm -hmm. um, that's still going to get you, you know, a place that you're comfortable. So what are like three tips that you could give the women that are listening on how to invest or so early and often, know. um, if you've never thought about budgeting before, I really, think just looking like we all hate looking at our credit card statement because like we feel that shame <laughs> of maybe purchases we've made and we're like, Oh, everybody knows how much money they make. Here's what I'll tell you. Everybody knows how much money they make, right? We're a little maniacal about it in our society. Cause again, it's quantifying our value, even though it shouldn't be right. It's again, ridiculous. I want to throw that out, but knowing what you spend 
that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. And our spending habits maybe change year to year. I mean, if you're about to have a baby, mm. you're about to have a whole nother list of expenses there, sister. So, you know, for, for women in my age category, our, our lives are shifting. I know for a lot of folks that I work with who are my clients who are in their 40, uh, their 50s and 60s, they're caring for elderly parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the early and often learning what your spending habits are is really important because that dictates what you're in a position to invest. Yeah. Um, I think too, when you spend money and you actually look at what you're spending money on, you find out what you actually do value. Because if you're going and buying, uh, you know, Jimmy Choo shoes every week, (laughs) not that that's anything wrong with that, but like, you know, that you value shoes. Whereas if you're looking, you know, like I use it too for clients of mine who are trying to lose weight. If you're constantly eating Twinkies and Ho-Hos and Doritos, that's where you're valuing your health and fitness, <laughs> you know? Right. So, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, this is just simply like a wake up call, right? Like I'm going to share some pretty killer statistics right now. 80% of men die married. Mm. 80% of women die single. Meaning you're going to have to go it alone at some point, probably at maybe one of the most vulnerable points of your life when you're older. Mm. So again, building a relationship with somebody that you trust, that you like, that can be with you through the long run. Um, Maybe somebody who is a little, a generation or two younger than you so that they can be with you while you mature. Mm. Um, Mm. Widows outlive their husbands by 14 years. Wow. That's, I mean, in addition to just the lonely aspect of it, that's a long time to be spending and consuming right on your own right and depending Um, on how what's going on in that situation whether you're working or whether you're retired what's coming in right exactly and a lot of times you might be retired by then so you're on what we call a fixed income and Mm -hmm. whatever it is you've saved and your investments (laughs) plus your social security that's it so making sure you've thought through what your number is um again i call i think this is just call it the reality check but 50% of marriages these days do end in divorce. Mm-hmm. No one shows up on their big day at the altar or you know, wherever it is you, you seek to get married these days and expect divorce. But statistically, it happens. Right. And so there's you know, a lot that you can do to just make sure you maintain your own credit score, mm. right? And that, you know, there's a lot that a, the legal profession could go into for this. Um, right. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> just it, it's a point in time that you you know you never expected to have to be on your own thinking about things. So yeah. just taking the time to educate yourself. And again, it doesn't have to be your new number one hobby. It's just know who your resources are, right? Everybody likes mm. to say they have a guy when something mm. happens. Breaks or whatever, yeah. <laughs> have a have a guy or a gal. I don't care. If you prefer a female. Have an Eileen. <laughs> have somebody you can call when you kind of have these issues because yeah. the reality is, is we have all this software and analytics and research at our fingertips to help you quantify. Mm. Most people are flying blind. They have numbers in their head that they anchor on based on a friend or a family or, you know, a very short, narrow window of spending that they think is going to be their spending level forever and ever. Well, the reality is, you know, people get promotions, people get laid off you know, just because you're making a certain amount of money one year doesn't guarantee you're going to be making that exact same amount of money another year. And right. again, coming back to behavioral finance, we anchor on things and there's a recency factor. And, you know, the older you get, the more of your time and your effort you put into something, you know, there's opportunity costs there for, you know, what you've committed yourself to. So change is harder as you get older. So mm. all of these things compound into how you ultimately will react if you find yourself in circumstances that feel challenging financially. Um, But I think the punchline and the beauty of this and why I'm trying to appeal to any woman who's listening is 95% of women will be their family's financial decision maker at some point in their lives. So knowing your numbers um, is really important, like knowing what your net worth is. What what do you own and what do you owe, right? What are your assets and your liabilities? Um, what's your personal balance sheet look like? Uh, that's really important. And for whatever reason, in financial assessments, men and women come in pretty close. Um, and here's a depressing statistic. 
only 39% who passed financial literacy assessments, Mm -hmm. only 39% of men passed and 35% of women passed. So So what does that that number? What do you mean by literacy? Just understanding what's going on? Yeah. Understanding like what is debt? What is an asset? What are securities? Wow. 35%? Yeah. These numbers are depressing. So thank you for letting me even come on for your step. (laughs) (laughs) But the point is 39 and 35 are numbers that are pretty close together. So there's not a meaningful difference between men and women. Right. The first line is that, you know, if you're- None of us know what's going on. (laughs) Less than 40% of humanity are- passing financial literacy tests. I mean, we could, again, have a whole podcast about how we can have education reform to get people Mm -hmm. smart on money. I mean, we have people thinking about aging longer. We call that longevity risk in my business. You know, in the 1700s, you were only going to live till 60 years old. And now, you know, babies being born today, the actuarial tables say you're going to live to a hundred. Right. My grandma is 98. Oh my gosh. And my grandfather on my, so that's my mom's mom, but my grandfather on my dad's his dad. He was almost 102 before he passed. Wow. You got some good genes there. I know. I'm hoping <laughs> I got some of them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as long as it's coherent. <laughs> probably have all the like athleticism and good fitness in your blood. That's incredible. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's longevity risk, right? Mm-hmm. And then the cost of college, which was always underscored as so important. And, you know, that's yeah. the now, but yes, regardless, we've seen, you know, the inflation for education, yeah. the 800 percent right right? you know versus when i was born and what my parents paid so there's all these things and costs associated with the goals we have for ourselves and if you don't take an inventory once in a while you can end up in a circumstance that if, if only you had planned your outcomes would have been better and this kind of comes back to trust because if you're not comfortable talking to somebody about your money it's hard to look back and five years and 10 years and 20 years and know exactly what the mistake cost you. Mm, right. Right. Yeah. It's hindsight. I, I think you touched on something earlier. You had said, um, and to, cause you said you went to school for behavioral finance. Is that what you said? Yeah. I got to take some behavioral finance, which I think is interesting because like there is a lot of shame around money and I recently have been diving into psychology and I have been adding it in the mindset part of what I teach for my clients, but I also used it on me. But one of the interesting things I find is that money itself is neutral. Like it's not good. It's not bad. It just, it's just paper laying there or numbers in the bank. Mm -hmm. And it's what people think about money is what, makes you either do one thing or the other or think someone's horrible or someone's not horrible, which is very interesting because we have so much shame around money, but there's, there's really no reason or envy. envy. Yeah. Yeah. Or jealousy. Yeah. And I, 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 my belief is that there's enough money in the world for everybody, Mm -hmm. you know, and I feel that if you are wealthy or if you have extra funds, you know, that, Like it's not, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be wealthy because once you have that money, you can do so much more with it. And instead of like, I think people play small and don't go for their dreams. I think I'm going off on a tangent on another story. (laughs) No, that's so true. And I can totally, you know, vouch for my client base who are significantly wealthy, as I mentioned, or you mentioned in introducing me, I work with families and individuals who are creating multi-generational wealth, meaning you know, right. not just your children, but maybe your grandchildren even. And I think my clients are outrageously philanthropic. And, and again, maybe that's why they've chosen me. And, you know, they right. like the idea of investing according to their values. But I yeah. couldn't agree with you more that if that's what you do with it, it's, it's completely, you know, up to you. And I think that um, I agree with you on the tangent you were going off on. Yeah, I think that the more wealth that you have, the more you can share with everyone. Right. You, know? you can have an impact. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot less hurdles that you have to go over, <laughs> you know, the wealthier you are. So yeah, yeah. So definitely right. investing in your money and making it grow while you're napping. Right. I like sure. to say you might have the difference between more challenging decisions and more than ample choices. Mm hmm. And as you think about as a young person or as a female, 
the time value of money, the, the beauty of compounding is that if you can start saving and investing early, right, that money is working for you for a longer period of time and you can stick to a budget and you can create value, you will have more choices as opposed to more challenging decisions. And at the end of the day, like you said, money is neutral. It's mm -hmm. just a tool and right. there are right. trade-offs no matter what. Yeah. Um, but that is, that is, I think, really key to things that you have to think about what kind of choices you want for yourself in the future. And it's really hard coming back to, you know, why people don't even want to take action because it feels too far off. They're like, oh, when I get to this age, I'll be grown up enough to think mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. But You'll yeah. probably never regret getting your financial house in order younger and earlier in life because that's just the longer runway to grow that. Yeah. And I, good. I was going to okay. say, I think this is another parallel to fitness. You know, the, like I have, I have two teenagers, which I'm scared to say, but <laughs> you know, I try to teach them nutrition and they, you know, have an understanding of food. And I think when you start younger and you have that foundation of, you know, what is good food, what is, what is working out or what is moving your body, you know, it trickles down the line as you get older, but it's also not to say that even if you are in your forties or fifties, you can still get started on saving money or doing things that are going to financially help you and even fitness too. So it's like, 100%. you can start at any point in your life. Yeah. One of the reasons I was so honored that you invited me on this show is that I've been giving seminars for a long time. Again, I'm, a lot of my clients happen to be male um, when I worked at Goldman Sachs. And so oftentimes I was invited as a woman to speak to their woman clients. And I always give a toast that they, to your health because there's nothing more important, right? Like m m money might not fix your health. Right. It is like, it is secondary. And, you know, we talk about trust a lot in our business and you trust the doctor with your health and, you know, we're trusting our whole healthcare system during this COVID crisis to their advice is coming at us nonstop via the mm. media. So I give this toast and I say to your health because it's what's most important to your wealth, because it's what dictates a lot of things for you. And it's something that's always on our mind, no matter what, it could be a stressor or a source of pride, but it's, you know, it's what I make a living having people come to me for, and then to your happiness, because I, mm. again, I loved your last podcast when you talked about um, mental health and, you know, in a state of fear, how you can rise above that. And, you know, really people just want to be happy. And I hope that, you know, my clients that work with me, that money isn't an issue for them, right? That it's not a cause of stress. There's, right. we'll always come back to the psychology that you were talking about getting yeah. into and I can talk about this for hours. But <laughs> I, I hope that I can instill a confidence in my clients that they know that they're so well taken care of with me as their advisor that they can worry about all the other stuff on their plate, which if yeah. you were to, you know, everybody you interview were to write their list of worries or stressors or concerns, those lists would be very long. And uh, so I always want everybody to, to really get to feel happiness. Yeah. And I think delegating some of those worries to an expert is helpful. <laughs> it goes back to the sure. boutique versus target. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I am going to venture into the speed round. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Okay. So there are quick questions for anybody who is new to the podcast. I'm basically just going to fire some questions at Eileen and we'll see what she has to say. <laughs> I feel like I need water for this. That's Sorry. okay. I know we've been talking a while. <laughs> okay. So question number one, coffee or tea? My mom is an avid tea drinker, but I would say on average, I'm more likely to go for the coffee. Okay. We can be friends. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So who taught you about money? So I think early on, my parents just taught us the importance of living frugally, but, um, you know, when I finally achieved a level of success where I felt like I was in a position to start investing, right? You're not in that survival mode anymore. Mm -hmm. You recognize that there's a little bit of extra and the importance of getting. And I was taught very early on by, um, you know, well, Goldman Sachs very much teaches you long-term greed. So always doing the right thing. But when it comes to your personal finances, I had some really great mentors um, who were just ahead of me in life and had crushed it. And they said, like, it's easy come, easy go. You might feel like you are king of the hill, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, in financial services one year and it can be extremely humbling the next. So never live like a jerk, right? (laughs) Don't let your first get rich year or couple of years go to your head. And I think that really stuck with me and it reinforced what my parents had already said. But I think, you know, there's a lot of people who, when you work so hard, you reach a certain level of success, you do feel entitled to enjoy it, right? You do feel entitled to upgrade. And, you know, by no means is there anything wrong with that, but just recognizing that what you're spending today, that's not, you know, maybe that's a depreciating asset, like a Mm. fancy car or something Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. is not necessarily always working for you while you sleep. Right. I think we should have t-shirts made up that says, don't live life like a jerk. There was another voice word, but we, gotcha. are, we, went, over the, we went over the ground rules. All right. That's okay. Neither one would work. Okay. So what is your favorite book and why? Um, wow. That's a great question. I like a lot of fiction, um, but I always feel like for work and for life, I'm reading all these like self-help and motivational oh. business books. Mm-hmm. So I, I really like the book and it, it's going to fall in that latter category, Grit by Angela Duckworth. Mm-hmm. Um, I have just always been so competitive and determined that when I saw that this fabulous author did all of these studies that said that you can have success based on this characteristic, that you don't have to be a naturally gifted human being because I don't feel like I'm particularly naturally gifted. <laughs> I've always had to work really hard. And so to know that that hard work has meaning in life in a variety of categories was really validating to me. So I just love Angela Duckworth and all of her anecdotes and and her research. Yeah. Um, I read that book too. It was a good book. Yeah. Um, If you like motivational books or self-helpy that aren't too woohoo-y, like I'm not too much into the woo, (laughs) but, (laughs) um, and there's a curse word coming, but it's a Jen Sincero. It's called You Are a Badass my favorite book, hands down. And if you follow my podcast, you will hear me talk about it probably 10 times. <laughs> at least. Isn't it great when you, that stuff sticks with you and it just like comes back to you in conversation. You can like regurgitate it. And it's like the yeah. foundation of your, your like life baseline. I think that yeah. that's not, sounds like what I would like. Yeah. I, it was, um, it was a couple years ago when I read it and I actually audible.com and I listened to that book. I swear it was like 11 times in, in a summer and um, it was just so like mind tweaking and it was, it really sparked my interest into kind of diving into self-help, but the psychology again of like why we do the things that we do, which is fascinating, but great book. She also has, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's called You Are a Badass Making Money. Another good book, same person. So check those out as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, next question. What is your favorite movie? This is a really, like, <laughs> I'm bad at watching movies. I'm not good at sitting through them. Um, <laughs> but I will always, like, love Wedding Crashers. Okay. Yeah. Now that's a, oh, oh wait, no, wait. Is that with, the like, one with the. And Vaughn and. I'm thinking oh. of another, I'm thinking of Bridesmaids, I think. Oh, that's another, that's another good one. But yeah, <laughs> Wedding Crashers just always did it for me. It's very humorous. <laughs> What is your, this is the last question. What is your favorite inspirational quote besides don't live life like a jerk? (laughs) So my sister and I, my sister, Erin, she's a physical therapist. She's incredible. Um, And my brother is in my business as well. So we have like the people. I was a PTA, a physical therapist assistant. Yeah, no, I know that. I remember when we first (laughs) met, I was like, that's incredible. Like, I'm on your page. There you go. My upbringing. Um, and, you know, I've torn both my ACLs, so I love what you guys yeah, do. I, 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 you're exercising without. What any, happened with your ACL? Because I know you had said you tore. Can I ask? Um, soccer on my oh, 18th okay. birthday. I'm mm. not D1 material anyway. So I went oh. back to playing. <laughs> had a great time in Miami, Ohio. Learned a lot. Went back to soccer <laughs> after college. And then uh, tore my right ACL when I was just about to turn 30 and moved to Philadelphia. So I've done a lot. I've been under the knife a lot. So I really value great physicians and a great physical therapists and the importance of rehab and fitness and all that tied together. Yeah. It really speaks to me. Um, but my quote, my, I was just saying that my sister loves quotes and we share quotes a lot with one another. So uh-huh. it's hard to pick one, but 
the tangent you were going off of when you said like that people don't take risks and they don't try to live their dreams. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really true that people are really scared to fail, whether it's because of shame or financial consequences and what other people will think. (laughs) Yeah. What society will believe about you, but like we only get to live once. There's like that YOLO, you know, hashtag that people say, but there's uh, a quote and my mom got it for me when I was pretty young and I think it's David Thoreau and it says go confidently in the direction of your dreams live the life you imagined Mm -hmm. and circling back to your punchline about mental health and that your mind is what dictates so much we spend so much time worrying there's this wall of worry and there's not necessarily enough imagination and When we were little, like babies, mm-hmm. all we did in school, I feel, was like try to imagine and fantasize and dream. Yeah. And then you move into adulthood, and adulthood can be so much more responsibility, challenging. We live in this age of social media where either everybody's looking at us or you're trying to be looked at, and when you don't want that. And I think using your imagination to create the life that you want is very, very important. And yeah. that drives me a lot. I think as we get older, we are, we think we're expected to be realist and be realistic. And if you're realistic, you're not really dreaming because Mm -hmm. if you're thinking what other people are worried, you know, worried about what other people are thinking about you, or you think it's irresponsible or something like that. But yeah, I think that people are so boxed into their little comfort zone and of course they're comfortable. Who, why would you want to be uncomfortable? <laughs> like, well, it's hard to be complacency because complacency is average. Yes. And nobody yes. when they were little wanted to be average. They no. wanted to be amazing at something. Again, if we interview right. the five-year-old version of ourselves, what would we say we wanted to be when we grow up and how many of us end up actually executing that? I wanted to be in the FBI. So I'm oh, here. cool. I'm I wanted school. to be a professional ballet dancer. At 13, I told my parents, I want to, I'm going to be a professional ballet dancer. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do it. I got, I did it. I, yes. And I, I, you know, the only reason I did do it, well, one of the many reasons, but I remember telling myself, this is like a young career. So like, there's no way I would have been like 30 and trying to get a job as a dancer. (laughs) Like you just, it does, that's just not the way it works. Like when you're in your twenties, you're at your peak Mm -hmm. dancing. So that was one of my driving forces that I did go to school. I went and got a bachelor of fine arts, but right after that, I got a job in a ballet company and I knew that I wouldn't be wanting to do this. Like I can't imagine being in a ballet class right now. (laughs) Everybody wants to put my leg up there, you know, (laughs) Yeah, it is, but it's different. It's like, the, um, we are totally getting off on tangent, but like the, the quality of ballet that I did when I was at my like best fitness with dance is totally different than where, like, I'm actually stronger and I think I'm healthier in where I am now in my forties, but I could not imagine just it's just, it's grueling. It's really it is like, so sad when we age to see that way that the ship has sailed. I mean, any of us who did like really competitive sports, when I see NCAA players, I'm like, oh my God, how did yeah. I never get to, I could never do that right well, now. Well, that's why I did. Yeah. That's why I was like, I'm doing this. Like, cause I knew later on, but yeah, like if I try and lift my right. leg up or turn, I'm like, I was a turner and a jumper and like, I could whip out like they're called pirouettes, five pirouettes, no problem. I try to spin once and I'm like, whoa, did I have a drink? <laughs> like, it's, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But I think there's other ways that um, I'm happier where I am. Like I'm much stronger. I have a lot more strength and I think vitality. And I think that as we age, I, you know, I think a lot of people, especially when you, I don't, I don't think you're over 40 yet, but when you, <laughs> yeah, when you hit 40, it's like, I, I talked to a lot of friends and they're like, well, you know, we might as well just toss the towel in because it's all downhill from here. This is as good as it gets. You're going to live another 60 years. No. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, I, I just, I, I hope that people will be like want to try to step out of their comfort zone and be like, well, maybe I can be a healthier version of myself. And then, you know, take those little small steps um, to 
See, it's hard to live your dreams in retirement if you don't have functionality of your limbs. And yes, that is so important to maintain like everything. I mean, it's great to live a certain lifestyle, but lifestyle is, you know, not, there's still something to be said for quality of life, regardless of your lifestyle. And Right. Again, that comes back to fitness and health. And I think all of these things are extremely intertwined. So yes. I can't tell you how appreciative I am today of this opportunity. If I could just summarize in five things that I want women to know, it's to know your numbers, mm-hmm. to think about how to protect against unexpected outcomes, right? That you go into life and never know what's going to happen to you, but statistically it could. And just being aware of who to call and how to prepare Right. Organizing your financial house, right? Knowing your assets, your liabilities, and what your forecast is for your career mm. and for you know expenses you have associated with your dreams, and building your dream team, right? Having trusted professionals in your corner. You know, investing takes discipline. The same way getting the body you want right. takes discipline. You you sur- surround yourself with people who will hold you accountable and yeah. be there for you and give you good advice so that you can have the outcomes you want yeah. and then fund what you care about, right? Like we only get to do this like once mm-hmm. we're all encouraged these days to be the individuals we are. I can't tell you how many times I see like bring your full self to work, right? We're finally all being offered to do that. So think about, you know, how we bring our full selves to everything and how you can be doing that with where you, you know, invest your assets. So yeah. Yeah. thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you. I'm so glad you came on because like I said to be- to you before, it was like, I understand finance to an extent, <laughs> but I am on no level, like, like don't come and ask me for advice <laughs> on anything financial. <laughs> but I am so glad you took the time out and came on, and I hope this was so helpful. I'm sure it was helpful to many women out there. And it, can you let them know one more time where they can reach you? Um, on LinkedIn. Uh, Eileen, E-I-L-E-E-N, Ward, or on Instagram, uh, Eileen underscore Ward. And all these also will be at the show notes at shapeitupfitness.com, and you can check them out there. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on, and we will talk to everyone next week. Stay safe. Stay well. Yeah. Hey, if you were frustrated by moving more and eating less, but not seeing the inches go down, I want to help you fill in the missing pieces to get you the results that you desire. Head over to shapeitupfitness.com and schedule your consult to find out how you can ditch the diets for good and live in the leaner body you love.